Humpty Dumpty is about something that falls and when it falls recognises that it has nothing in its power or even in the power of those around about to do something to redeem the situation. It's, it's, a, actually, it's, it's a gospel story, really. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. It's something that encapsulates this human tragedy of the fall. We're fallen, and when we do, it's sometimes hard to know how to put it back together. And the story of the gospel is centered on the idea that there's been a fall, that there's been a brokenness, and there's nothing from outside us in terms of the world around us that can do anything to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. There's nothing that can bring John Herbert together again. Nothing that can bring Derek Shan together again in himself or in the world around. Andrew Clark couldn't put himself together for toffee. We need a saviour. We need the one who would come. And this is the very heart of our passage today. And Peter addresses the crowd and he's bringing a message before men and women who didn't think they needed to hear this message because they thought they were already living the story. They thought they were already there. But God had stepped in to do something in history that was going to prove to them that they needed something else. And Peter digs in to the ancient stories of the Bible and brings them to the fore. But he starts with the eternal story of Jesus. He starts to explain to them, although he's explaining all the razzmatazz of the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost, he starts with Jesus and the story of Jesus. He says to him, what does he say in verse 29 and 30 to 33? He says, this Jesus was a man approved by God, shown to be from God through the signs and the miracles and the wonders and the things that were achieved in his ministry. Peter's saying Jesus was was given for a purpose at the right time. And he was saying that this Jesus who came, who you killed, possessed within himself because he was God, this unquenchable force of life, and God raised him from the dead according to his purposes, and his body would not see decay. And because Jesus died, because Jesus was in the tomb, because Jesus rose again, You and I, when we're in him, have that promise. That's the old, old story. We could finish there. That is the old, old story. You're broken. You have fallen. Jesus came. He lived the perfect life. He took upon himself the sins of the world. Not even the world, but your sins. And he took them all the way to the tomb. He took them all the way to the grave. And then the inimitable force of God raised him to life and began the new creation. And when we are in him, when we are in him, we are new. Amen. Let's, no, no, we're not going to go on. We're going to think about this a bit more. But that is the old, old story. That is the old, old story. And we need to hear it again and again and again. Friend, there's nothing you can do. It's all been done. If your testimony of your faith begins, well, I, I, did, I, I confessed or I came to Jesus or I, it's the wrong place to start. Our testimony begins, Jesus. Jesus came. Jesus lived. Jesus died. Jesus went to the tomb. Jesus rose again. And because of that, I can be in him. I can be hump to dump to sat in the wall. Hampton Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Hampton together again but Jesus. And so that's where Peter begins. Imagine you're hearing that for the first time. You've been in Jerusalem. You've probably heard, although we're several weeks on from the death and the resurrection of Jesus, you've probably still heard all this stuff going on, especially if you were living in Jerusalem. You've heard about this. And here Peter brings it right before them right before them. It was caused by you, it was for you, and this is what I proclaim. 
But then you get an interesting part uh, because Peter, in trying to sort of um, sink this message home to the people, goes to a place you might not expect. We've seen Jesus um, walking with the disciples and pointing to Moses and pointing to all these sorts of things to explain what happened. But in this occasion, Peter turns to David to give an illustration. Why do you think that is? Because there they were in the vicinity of the, the glorious temple uh, where, where David had in his heart to build this place that, where God would reside. And so they're in David's city, you know, once in royal David's city, so you know, all, all that sort of stuff. And there they actually are. And he points the people backwards in verse 34 to 36. He points them back to King David and his experience in Psalm 16. That's what we have quoted there. And there David, prophetically, not knowing exactly how this was going to be fulfilled, has that sense and writes it down that there was going to be a day when God would provide someone who would rule on his father's throne, on his throne, who would be the one sent from God. David knew that. And more than that, David knew that his great, 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 great grandson was going to be the one that he would call the Lord. Now, that's a turn up. That's a turn around. How many of you fathers uh, would allow your, uh, your, your, you would call your sons Lord? No, you wouldn't. It's the, it's the wrong way around, you know. Uh, sometimes I think my son thinks he's the Lord, but he's really not, you know. Sometimes he's right to try and remind him of that. Um, it's the wrong way around. But here's David saying, actually, there's one that is coming from my line who will actually be my Lord. And, and, and death will not hold him. He will not decay. He will not be abandoned to the grave. He will be established forever. Imagine what it's like when you're standing there on that day of Pentecost hearing that. You think, oh yeah, I remember that, Sam. I remember that. I remember that we're, we're living out this promise that we're, we're waiting for the coming king. And here's Peter saying that Jesus Christ is the one that David, King David, our golden shiny king, David the Great, was speaking of. Here he is. And what have we done to him? Because it, it'll be starting to dawn on them, you see. That thought, I bet it started in their minds as they were listening to Peter. What if we have killed the Messiah? What if we have killed the Messiah? And what does it mean for me if by the power of God he's been risen again? I am in trouble. I am in trouble. And so they begin to realise the importance of who this person is, who this man is, and what the response should be. And then, gloriously, we get the response. And this is what is invited as being the eternal response of everyone. I want to read to you again verse 37 down to 41. When the people heard this, that is this message about David this message about Jesus, here's what he said. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and all the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That <coughs> is the appropriate gospel response. Let's go back to Humpty Dumpty. I don't know what Humpty Dumpty did. We weren't told what he did. Did he just sit there and languish in his brokenness? Well, probably. As humans are good at that, you know, we recognise that, you know, we're strugglers. We recognise that we've got, you know, challenges and problems. And many of us are content to uh, sit and, and wallow in that. Uh, or, or we try and do uh, self-help stuff to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps. I don't know when the last time uh, you went into one of these um, big bookstores, maybe in Glasgow or something, or Waterstones or somewhere. Um, one of the biggest sections uh, in those bookshops is the self-help department. Uh, 
I mean, you can get help for absolutely everything. Are you a bit fat? We can help you with that. Uh, are, are you this or that? Are you, are, we can help you with that. Um, are you feeling low? We can help you with that. Are you feeling sleepy? We can help you with that. Are you feeling always awake? We can help you with that as well. We can bore you to tears. We can help you with absolutely everything. <coughs> but it all comes to nothing because at the end of the day, all you have is a slightly better helped Humpty Dumpty on the floor <laughs> grappling for stuff. We can't help ourselves, but in this situation, we see Peter driving home for these people and for these people what we need to hear. A, there's nothing you can do, but B, there is a response to make because of what Jesus has done. One of the most, one of the most precious gifts that God provides for us, yes, is Jesus. We all know that, yeah, the Sunday school answer, one of the most precious gifts is Jesus. But one of the, the second most precious gift that you might not think is a gift is the gift of repentance. <coughs> it's a precious gift. And without that, we, we don't experience what Paul describes, that godly sorrow that brings repentance and that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. We, we don't re- experience that sense of being opened up to the grace of God. And so you, if you're in that place where you've been listening to gospel stuff all your life and you kind of know the story but it hasn't made sense to you yet, my prayer for you is that God would give you this godly sorrow this spirit of repentance. What happened to these men, these proud men? They were cut to the heart. There was something in what Peter said that the Holy Spirit used like a knife to divide them where they needed to be divided so that the light and the glory of the gospel could get in. And the instruction from there was a simple act of obedience. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. And there in the picture of baptism, we have a perfect illustration of what's happening. Have you seen someone being baptized as an adult? Yes, you've seen that? Yeah, yes. You've got this, you're in your, your river. I mean, only, you know, rivers are the best place to be baptized, of course. All the sea, you know, you're baptized. You're in the water. You're in the water and you're preparing to go down under the water. Yeah. And when you're going down under the water, you're entering your death. You're entering into the death of Jesus Christ. You're saying in that moment, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. I'm dead to myself, considering myself dead to myself. We're burying you before you're buried. And you're down there for a good half an hour. Yeah, just, to, just to drive it home, or it feels like that sometimes. And then you come up, and then there's air, and there's light And then you realize the truth of the message that Christ is your life and you're now in him. You're now in him. And so Peter on this day, when the men are cut to the heart, invites them to repent, to turn around, to change their thinking, to change their way, having received the gift of repentance, and then to make the response, to make the response the giving of the lives, the laying of it down. This is Humpty Dumpty saying, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. But he can do something. And then Peter went on, as preachers do, and he warned them to save themselves from this crooked generation. There's nothing in the world, he's saying, that will give you the hope and the transformation that you will find in this story I'm telling you now. And so they respond. And so they respond. Now, as a preacher, as a pastor, as one who speaks the words of God, I've discharged my duty. Let it not be known that you haven't heard the gospel in this place. There it is, plain and simple. And you know what? We're not going to move on from there. We don't move on from there. We move on to figuring out what it means to live our lives in light of the gospel. But it's all about the gospel because it's all about Jesus. He is the one who came. He is the one who picks up 
the broken parts of me and does with them what nobody else can do. He brings new life where there was only death. We give thanks to him. But in this moment, I want to ask you once again, do you know this for yourself? Do you know this for yourself? I'm praying that God will give you the gift of a repentant heart, a godly sorrow that brings repentance and that leads to life and life eternal. Let's pray together. 